advanced accounting 22 currency translation adjustment and currency heading this is ken boyd the owner of st louis test preparation here's our facebook page st louis test prep and our linkedin group mba accounting and finance i recently spent a lot of time with a student on a project that related to foreign currency which i think is one of the most difficult things both to teach and to learn when it comes to currency generally and accounting even more specifically. So first of all, why do we even bother? What's the overall risk? And so I talk about it right up here. What is the, why do we deal with or have to deal with a currency translation adjustment or CTA you'll see there in parentheses. When overall cat, when cash flows, plain old vanilla cash is translated from a local currency in another country to the currency used for financial reporting, and we're going to do an example in a minute, the transaction may result in a gain or a loss when we translate cash from one country to another. Recognizing the gain or loss is referred to as a currency translation adjustment. Okay, so who cares about that? Why do we care? Well, here's the financial impact. Gains and losses on currency translation make financial forecasting difficult for the company. Uh, right now it is summer almost of 2012 and we have huge upheaval going on in Europe. Lots of economic problems which affects their currency values and their currency values fluctuate even more so than they normally do. So if you can't financially forecast, it makes your financial results just as uncertain. And so what I say here as a wrap-up is, if the translations between currencies are not hedged, which I'll explain later, they can create large financial losses. How do the losses occur? They occur if there's a large fluctuation in the currency exchange rate, which is the difference in value between, one currency, between two currencies. And we're going to see that in just a minute. So here's my example. General Electric does business in England under the name GE Britain. I'm just making that up. And they are taking they are converting two dollars because they're a US company that reports for financial purposes in US dollars. And they are converting cash from their British subsidiary, and the British subsidiary operates in pounds, the British pounds. So in my example on March 1st. GE converts 100 pounds received in Britain to dollars. And we're just going to assume that the exchange rate is for every two British pounds, you can get one US dollar. In other words, it takes two British pounds to buy a dollar. So if you have 100 pounds, that converts into 50 US dollars or 100 pounds divided by two. <clears throat> That's what happens on March 1st. Now we get to April. Same process. GE is 100 pounds that they had in, in, in Britain. They want to convert it to dollars. <clears throat> but the exchange rate has changed. It now only takes 1.5 British pounds to get a US dollar. Instead of 2, it only takes 1.5. And I say that right here. So when we convert, instead of getting 50 US dollars, 100 divided by 2, we get about $67, 100 divided by 1.5. So <clears throat> the way that we can look at this is, is that we get more dollars per 100 pounds, more dollars per 100 pounds. And I should correct this to say the British pound has become less valuable in comparison with the dollar. The British pound has become, should be more valuable in comparison with the dollar. Reason is, apples to apples comparison. 100 pounds used to get you $50, now 100 pounds gets you $66, so the pound is more valuable. Why? Because you're getting more dollars. Now, we have another variable, which is, the amount of cash sent between these countries will vary also. So we have two moving targets. We have the amount of cash being sent back and forth, and we have a changing exchange rate. 
Okay. What if we're what if we what if GE, the company in the US, is sending cash to Britain? So that means we have to convert into British pounds because we're sending money to Britain. Okay? GE sends $50 American US uh, dollars to Britain. The exchange rate is for every dollar you get two pounds, you send 50 bucks US dollars, you get 100 pounds, 50 times two. That's what happens on March 1st. On April 1st, so maybe they're sending money every month to fund that operation. GE sends $50 to Britain. The exchange rate is changed. <coughs> Excuse me, it takes 1.5 British pounds to buy a dollar. So now, instead of getting 75 pounds when you send over 150 bucks, now you only, let me restate that. When you send $50, instead of getting 100 pounds, you only get 75 pounds. So now we're looking at it from the other direction. Dollar is going to Britain as opposed to British pounds coming back to the US. So the British pound has become less valuable. Why? Because we're getting fewer pounds, only 75, for every dollar that we send over. Fewer pounds are sent to Britain in April, only 75 versus March. So now that we've talked about that, we can flip back to the other example, and this is what makes it so difficult. What about the other direction? What about the other direction? The same relationship. Two pounds gets you a dollar. Now it only takes 1.5 pounds to get you a dollar. So it depends on which direction you're going. Which direction you're going. The bad news is that if you're sending money to Britain, you get fewer pounds than you did before. The good news is when you send dollars to the US, you get more dollars than you did before. You get more dollars than you did before. More dollars than you did before, the flip side is less pounds than you did before. In either direction, the pound is getting less valuable. Okay, let me do that one more time. Here, you're getting more dollars. Dollar is stronger. Dollar is stronger than the pound from March to April. Here, you are getting less pounds. March to April. In both cases, the pound is less valuable. So that's money going in both directions. Well, what about if we need, if we want to hedge? So here's the hedge in April 1st. We are concerned that we're not going to get that the pound is weakening, that we'll <coughs> get fewer pounds <coughs> when we send the same number of dollars to Britain. So on March 1st, GE enters into a hedge. They're going to pay a fee for that hedge. They're going to pay $2 to hedge 50 US dollars they plan on sending to Britain on April 1st. What do they get for that hedge? They pay $2 and they get the right to do something. And specifically, they get the right to convert $50 to 100 pounds, and that right expires on April 5th. So they have locked in until April 5th the right to continue to have this relationship even if the currency relationship changes. That's the good news. The bad news is you paid a fee for it. So now when we get to April 1st, how much dollars uh, is exchanged? How much currency is exchanged? Well, $50 converts to 100 pounds because of the hedge, but we have to, and that means 100 pounds. We convert 50 US dollars to 100 pounds less the cost of the hedge, which was $2 US or 4 British pounds because of the 2 to 1 relationship. So when we send dollars, the, when we send $50 April 1st, 
the pounds, the British pounds received by GE Britain are 96. The 100 pounds that we had in the currency exchange less the cost of the hedge, so we get 96 pounds, but that's better than we had before in April 1st. Up here, where we only got 75 pounds with no hedge, here we get 96 pounds with the hedge. So what's the result? The hedge on US on British pounds allows GE to send more pounds to GE Britain on April 1st than they could without the hedge. <clears throat> so for the income statement reader, the informed income statement reader, that person who's informed will realize that the gains and losses from currency fluctuations are unrelated to the more predictable income from operations. So if we're Levi's blue jeans, we make money manufacturing blue jeans and selling them. That's from income from operations. Currency fluctuations are non-operating. So keep that in mind also. That's as far as we're going to get on Advanced Accounting 22. You can get a list of all of our YouTube videos by type by sending me an email, an email ken at stltest.net. For additional videos that are not on the web, here's our website, stltest.net. For online tutoring one-on-one -on -one using gotomeeting.com, here's my phone number. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next time.